Home prices rose sharply in the past years in many parts of Ontario and across the country. It prompted all the parties in this year's election to put forward ideas for dealing with what is routinely called a housing shortage. And as it turns out, it's not just a problem here. With us to explain what's going on, we welcome in Washington, D.C., Jenny Schutz, Senior Fellow in the Metropolitan Policy Program at the Brookings Institution's Future of the Middle Class Initiative. And in London, Ontario, Mike Moffat, Senior Director at the Smart Prosperity Institute Think Tank and an Assistant Professor at Western University's Ivy Business School. And Mike, it's good to see you again. Jenny, great to have you on our program for the first time. We, um, I think everybody's been experiencing sticker shock over the past many months as they've looked at what it costs to buy a house in so many places around North America. There are myriad reasons, but let's focus on supply for the moment. Mike, why has supply become such an issue of late? Well, I'd actually say that this uh, issue goes back to about 2015 in Ontario, and it's all due to population growth. Ontario typically grows by about 100 to 120,000 people every single year, and we did rather consistently. But we had some policy changes starting in 2015, uh, increased immigration targets, and also in a more attractive market for international students. We basically changed how long international students could stay in the province uh, after they graduate. So all of a sudden, we went from growing at about 120,000 people a year to 200,000 people a year. So we've grown by almost a million people over the last five years. Uh, if we compare the last five years to the previous five years, uh, we've had 300,000 extra people in the province, but we've only built about 30,000 extra homes, and uh, most of those are one-bedroom condos. So you do the math there, that's nine or ten extra people for every one-bedroom condo. That is going to get you a housing shortage. <laughs> now, why is it that somewhere along the way, decision makers didn't say to themselves, we're inviting a whole lot of extra people in here and we're not giving them anywhere to live? Why didn't they make that computation? Well, it's this uh, fantastic problem that we have in Canada about jurisdictionality. So we, we have a federal government uh, that sets rules around immigration and uh, international student policy. Then we have uh, the province who set their sort of growth plans and need to sort of adjust for that accordingly. And we have colleges and universities uh, uh, bringing in international students. And then we have the municipalities uh, making their plans off of the provincial growth plan. And all of that takes time. And if we look at uh, provincial growth or uh, municipal growth plans across the province, some of these are anywhere from five to 15 years out of date. They don't incorporate uh, the new immigration targets, all of those changes that are going on. And it all goes to this sort of jurisdictional problem where different levels of government are responsible for different things and they don't necessarily interact well with each other. Gotcha. Jenny, maybe you could give us the lay of the land in the United States and in particular, what states uh, the housing shortage is particularly acute? Well, we've seen pretty similar dynamics to Canada at the national level. So house prices are up over 13% year over year, which is obviously faster than people's wages are growing. And we have similar kinds of issues on the supply side plus uh, demand side issues as well. So we're sandwiched between two historically large generations, the boomers, the older end, and millennials on the younger side. It's just a lot of people Millennials in particular are reaching their peak home buying years. They're getting ready to move out of the one bedroom apartments, buy their first house, have a little bit of extra space. And there aren't enough homes to accommodate all the people who want to live there. This has been traditionally true in places like New York and San Francisco and Boston, but we're actually seeing very rapid home price growth in some of the smaller metros, places like Boise, Idaho, Austin, Texas, Denver, Colorado. Those are seeing now the kinds of upwards pressure on housing prices that we've mostly associated with the big coastal cities. And the big question is, will Boise become San Francisco in 10 years? Huh, so this is not just a blue state thing. This is happening in the red states too. Absolutely. And we've seen some of the strongest rates of population growth and demand in places like Texas and Arizona. So the Sun Belt states have very strong demand for housing. They've traditionally built enough housing to accommodate growth, but they just haven't been able to keep up for the last couple of years. Okay, I'm going to ask our director, Sheldon Osmond, if he would, to bring up the chart, Sheldon, on page two. This is housing units per 1,000 population in G7 countries, and we're going to compare just a half a dozen or so of the major countries, France, Denmark, Japan, the UK, the US, and Canada. And for those listening on podcast and who can't see this, the bar graphs here, uh, France seems to be doing much better than most. 
in terms of building adequate housing per thousand population. Denmark in second, Japan in third, all of those countries above the G7 average. But then you get to the UK, the US and Canada, and we are all building less than the average home building that is taking place in the G7. And Jenny, we heard some of the explanations for why it's that way in the province of Ontario. Maybe if you could broaden them, the microscope a bit and, and tell us why would it be this way across the G7 in so many places? Notice that what we're particularly seeing is uh, tight restrictions on supply in the Anglo countries. Um, and that's because they share a similar approach to land use governance and development. In particular, we've chosen to devolve control over land use and development to local governments and the process tends to empower existing residents. So people who already live in a community don't necessarily want more houses added. They're very sensitive about their property values, so they don't want rental housing added. And those existing homeowners come out to community meetings and complain about things and push back. That tends to block development or delay it, dragging out the process and making it more expensive. And if you think about who would benefit from building homes, it's usually people who don't already live in a community, who can't afford to live there and who are waiting for new housing, but they're not included in the uh, political process that would allow them to show up and say, yes, more apartments would be great, otherwise I can't move here. Gotcha. All right, well, we do love our charts on this program, so we're gonna put another one up now, and Mike, maybe I'll get you to take us through this one. This is, and again, for those listening who can't see it, I'll read it in some detail. This is real house prices over the last 20 years or so. And if you look at countries like New Zealand, Canada, Sweden, Britain, the U.S., and Germany, the lines go pretty straight right across the first 15 years of this, of the, uh, of this century. But then, as Mike indicated in his first answer, in, from about 2015 on, the lines are, all start to move up, uh, particularly in New Zealand and Canada. Uh, they start moving up to the sky. And, Mike, I wonder if you could sort of compare and contrast why... For example, in some countries like Germany, there has not been a skyrocketing of prices, but as you look to New Zealand and Canada, there sure has been. What's the diff? Well, I, I think the diff is, difference is uh, partly due to the sort of demographic differences, partly uh, due to things like, like immigration policy and international student uh, uh, policy. But a lot of it does come down to that sort of local control, local zoning. So it's uh, ultimately supply and demand. And Canada, and particularly Ontario and the GTA, uh, we're getting hit both ways where you know we have all of this uh, demand coming in, which is fantastic. We're having you know talented 20 somethings from all over the world. Uh, we have all the kids that were born 20, 25 years ago now want, wanting homes. And then all of these supply restrictions that are at a local level. And that local level is important because you know what ends up happening is if Toronto doesn't build enough homes, then people start moving to Milton or Hamilton and they're not building enough homes, so then people end up moving to, to Brantford or wherever else. So the decisions that one municipality makes creates a spillover effect to other municipalities that aren't really uh, part of the decision-making process. Jenny, does it work the same way in the United States in as much as there may be a national housing policy in place, but the fact is where it happens is on the ground in each municipality, and if you can't make it work there, then it ain't gonna work. It's definitely true that supply is mostly controlled by local governments. And so that's where we really see the restrictions. On the other hand, we actually do have national policies that make this somewhat worse, in particular our tax policies, which create subsidies for home ownership. Uh, so the mortgage interest deduction, capital gains exclusion, encourage people to put more of their savings into housing than other kinds of assets. Housing is the primary financial asset for middle income households, which makes people also very sensitive to anything that could lower their property values. So we have subsidies to demand at the national level and we have restrictions on supply at the local level. Add the two of those things together and that'll get you spiking prices. Hmm. Okay, let me do a follow up with you on that, Jenny, because if we, again, if we hearken back to that last graph, we saw that the German experience is a very flat line. Over the 20 years, they have not seen prices skyrocketing, despite the fact that they've got a very strong economy, and Berlin is obviously one of the truly magnificent cities of the world. What explains their ability to keep house prices fairly regular, where Canada, New Zealand, other countries have not been able to? So Germany is a fascinating contrast. It's one, it's one of the only majority renter rich countries. More than half of German households rent their homes. And part of that is because of differences in the federal tax code. 
So in the US, you are subsidized to own your house and then you can deduct interest paid on the mortgage. But in Germany, you only get to deduct interest paid on a mortgage if you don't live in your own house. So investors who own rental properties can deduct that from their taxes, which encourages people often to create sort of an in-law unit, an apartment within their house. The owner actually lives in the apartment and they rent out the other space, getting income tax, in tax benefits and the rental income from that. That's encouraged a lot more kind of small scale rental housing, which has helped take pressure off of the market. Fascinating. Okay, Mike, we've never had mortgage deductibility in this country. Uh, I remember, oh gosh, 1979, I think Joe Clark's government flirted with the idea for a while, but ultimately they didn't stick around long enough to do it. But those ideas you just heard from Jenny, is that something maybe we ought to be looking at here? Well, I, I do think we do need to look at our tax. And we, we saw that uh, from our federal parties, you know, looking at uh, things like cracking down on speculators, uh, cracking down on uh, foreign investment for, for non-residents. But, but ultimately, if we have three or four people uh, all bidding on the same home, if we're building one new apartment unit uh, for every nine or new 10 new Ontarians, then you know we're going to have shortages. And I think often, too often we focus on the sort of price, which is essentially zero sum. Like if I pay a lot, that means I'm paying some landlord a lot. I think the bigger problem is the people who get priced out entirely don't end up getting that apartment or house and have to live somewhere else. You know, we have a lot of 20 somethings still, you know, living in their parents' basement, would love to start a, a family, you know, get married, have a house, have kids. And they're in this sort of period of arrested development where they just can't do that because the housing is, is unavailable. And that doesn't really change by, by tweaking the tax code. All right, Jenny, let me look at another side of this equation, which is how much of this problem do you think can be laid at the doorstep of so-called foreigners who like a real estate deal when they see one and see a lot of security, for example, in the Canadian market and have decided to make significant purchases here and, of course, in other places in the United States as well? It's certainly true that since the Great Recession, we've seen a lot more interest from large institutional investors putting their money into real estate in safe locations. There's always been some amount of that. Real estate is a great place to park money. Insurance companies, pension funds have used this for decades because they can put money there for 30 years. But we've seen a little bit of a difference in who is investing money. So in the US, we've seen the rise of private equity firms. Uh, we've seen global capital coming in as well, including things like sovereign wealth funds. So part of the problem is just there is an awful lot of global wealth looking for someplace safe to park. But what we've seen is that private equity firms aren't interested necessarily in the 30-year return. They want to put their money in an asset that gives them high returns in the short run. So they're more likely to say, buy an apartment building in someplace like Los Angeles, do a quick rehab of it, and then jack up the rents so that they can get more return in the short run. And we've seen more interest from private equity going into these supply constrained markets with very strong demand because they really see this as a protected market. There's not a lot of competition among landlords, which make this a great place to own property. Now, Mike, we hear that phenomenon happening um, basically in two places in Canada, Toronto and Vancouver, uh, where not only that happens, but of course, uh, foreigners also buy houses and then just have them sit empty, uh, which doesn't help um, get people into houses as well. Do um, Is it... Is that a feature in any other of the bigger cities of this country other than Montreal, Toronto, um, Vancouver, or is that really a feature of just those places? It, it mostly seems to be uh, Toronto and Vancouver, but again, it has sort of a spillover effect that uh, you know our hottest housing markets in terms of prices since 2015 are like London and Woodstock and Tilsonburg. And we don't have Russian oligarchs buying up Tilsonburg. <laughs> you know, what's what's happening is that we have, again, these sort of spillover effects uh, from a lack of housing. And we do know in Vancouver and in British Columbia, they've kind of thrown everything in the kitchen sink when it comes to these sort of policy prescriptions. So, you know, they've, they've got uh, vacant home taxes at multiple levels, both the provincial and municipal level. Uh, they've got uh, foreign buyer taxes and so on. They've done all of these things and they've had some marginal impact. They seem to have lowered price growth a little bit for those one bedroom condos, but it really hasn't changed much when it comes to family homes. All right. While you have the floor, Mike, I want to follow up with uh, what will be a bit of a controversial suggestion that you will no doubt have heard from others. And I'd like you to weigh in on it if you would. 
there are people who are going to be watching this and who will say, look, if we have a problem with not being able to build enough housing for the new immigrants that come to this country, maybe the idea shouldn't be build more homes. Maybe it should be take in fewer immigrants. Discuss. Well, that is certainly one policy uh, prescription, one possible solution. I would say it's a sort of worst uh, solution. You know, this is uh, a bunch of very talented 20-somethings who we need uh, to help us uh, with population aging, uh, to help us deal with the sort of economic and climate issues. And they contribute to the social uh, fabric of our society. So I think we should focus more on the supply side. And there are some solutions we can do. So one of the things that, that always boggles my mind is if I'm trying to build a house near a transit line in Toronto, there are parking minimums, which make it hard to build that house. Why are we making parking minimums by transit stations? The entire point of building near transit homes near transit stations is to get people on transit, but we're having to put you know use a lot of that land to uh, have, have parking lots for, for for cars. So there's a lot of creative solutions we could look at. We don't you know you could lower immigration rates, you could scare away international students, but I think there are better solutions than that. Jenny, how about in the United States? How much? Uh... How, how much do you think uh, this problem could be solved if the taps were turned down a, a little bit on immigration? Almost none, and then probably would make the problem worse. So we've actually seen lower levels of immigration since the Great Recession because jobs dried up. Um, the Trump administration's policies didn't exactly encourage more people to come to the U.S. And one thing that's significant about the supply side is that immigrant workers tend to be a very large share of the construction workforce. Builders are telling us they can't hire enough people to build homes. So if you crack down on the supply of workers who can help build, you're just going to make the problem worse. Now, at the risk of starting a generational war here, I do want to talk about boomers versus millennials, because it is a fact that millennials really can't get into the housing market. And one of the reasons many people would tell you is that boomers own a disproportionate share of the real estate markets, both in Canada and the United States. Jenny, is there anything that either could or should be done about that? So some of this is just the basic math of the generation. Boomers are a lot of people. There are a lot of bodies, and they occupy homes. We have seen an increasing length of tenure. So about 10 years ago, the typical length somebody would stay in their home was about 10 years, and now it's moved up to about 13 years. Boomers are staying in their homes longer than previous generations of older adults because they're healthier and they're living longer. So that's great um, and not something that we would try to interfere with even if we had the policy tools to do that. But what it does mean is that we're not seeing kind of a freeing up of the housing stock for younger generations, particularly millennials. And I will say that there's a big divide too between millennials whose parents are homeowners, particularly in expensive places like California, and millennials who are first time home buyers, so they don't have money that they can inherit from their families. This also splits very hard across the racial wealth gap in the US. Black families are much less likely to get assistance from parents or grandparents for their down payment. White families are more likely to get that, which makes it easier for them to get into the market as a first time home buyer. Mike, it does raise the question of whether this issue will in part resolve itself once the boomers start dying and leaving their money to their millennial children. What do you think? Well, first of all, as the Gen Xer on the panel, I'm glad that I'm excluded from this uh, <laughs> entirely and not, and not being uh, indicated as part of the problem. But I, I can speak to that. So I'm in my parents' house in London, Ontario right now. My parents are in their early 70s. They have threatened to move every year for about 10 years, and they never have and they never will, in part because there's no options for them. Uh, they have to sort of move somewhere, and we're not building all that many sort of senior-friendly communities or senior-friendly facilities in the neighborhoods that seniors want to live in. So they decide to sort of age in place. And I don't see that changing. And luckily, our boomers are living happier, healthier lives uh, than, than ever before, which is fantastic. So if we're waiting for that to be a solution, we are going to be waiting an awful long time. Uh, what do your uh, boomer parents think about having their Gen X son living with them, incidentally? <laughs> So I still live in Ottawa. I'm just uh, I'm just visiting uh, right now. Uh, so that they're lucky to have uh, gotten rid of me. I was lucky. We bought our first house in 2004, so we could uh, we could do that. But I often think that you know 
I bought, again, we bought it when I was 27. I bought my first home. Hmm. If I was 27 today, there's no way I could do that. No. You know, there's just not on the, the, the money we make. So, so I do feel for those boomer parents out there who have a lot of 25 year olds living in the attic, living in the basement that they just uh, can't get rid of because there's no housing available for them. Well, in our remaining moments here, then let's find out whether or not there actually is progress possible on this. Jenny, do you see us actually being able to build our way out of this problem? It's a, it's the, I think it's a good sign that we're having more conversations like this. So housing hasn't been on the national agenda, certainly in the U.S. before. We're starting to have more public debates about this, and people are more conscious that supply is a problem and that we're going to have to grapple with our existing land use and development issues. We're seeing more uh, progress on the policy front, particularly at the state and federal level. So local governments have been in charge of land use. They haven't allowed enough development. We've seen reforms from California, Oregon, Massachusetts all this year, passing laws to push back against some of the restrictive local zoning. States have a lot of authority and they could play a bigger role in this if they wanted to. The Biden administration is also very conscious that this has real economic consequences. So the Council of Economic Advisors has written one blog post about the problem of housing supply and one blog post about exclusionary zoning. They haven't figured out quite what the federal levers, levers are to push yet, but there's certainly more attention to this than we've ever seen before. So that's okay. That, that sounds like progress. There's a recognition that, that more needs to be done. Do you see ideas coming down the pipeline that'll actually get things done? There are a number of different proposals, states pushing back on specific local practices that make it hard to build. So for instance, making it easier for localities to change their zoning in a pro-housing way, uh, legalizing duplexes, which Oregon and California have now done statewide. These are baby steps in the right direction. Should say that we've spent maybe 30 years underbuilding housing and digging ourselves into a hole. So even if we got better policies tomorrow, it's still going to take at least a decade of steady increased production before we really get out of the hole. All right, Mike, let me ask you about the circumstances here in the province of Ontario. We know that the current Ontario government has, uh, I mean, put it... A, a massive accent on trying to create more supply in the housing se sector. How are they doing? Well, the, the, the reforms, I think, are, are helping, but there's more to be done. And, and fortunately, we are seeing uh, creative ideas from all the parties. Uh, you know, we have heard parties at the provincial level talk about legalizing duplexes and triplexes, uh, which would certainly help. There are things that can be done at the municipal level. Uh, Mayor Iveson in Edmonton has banned uh, parking minimums. Their, their uh, municipal government has done that. That's worth looking at. And I think the federal government can play a role. So the Liberal Party ran on this uh, housing accelerator, sort of $4 billion that they can use to help modernize uh, development systems at the at the local level, uh, you know, help get things built faster. But we've estimated at SPI that to house the growing population, Ontario is going to need one million new homes over the next 10 years. We've never done that, or at least not in my lifetime. So this is a big challenge, but there are policy levers that we can use at all levels of government to, to get us closer to a solution. We need a million, and how many are we on a pace to build right now? Well, in the last uh, last five years, we built about 330,000. So if we continue mm -hmm. that on, we yeah, we might get to about 650 or so. We need to get to a million. So that's that's going to be a challenge. That's going to be a regulatory challenge, but it's also going to be uh, a challenge uh, just getting all those sort of workers involved. And I know the provincial government has been doing a lot. Minister McNaught has been doing a lot to get uh, more young people into the trades. And that's exactly the kind of thing that we're going to do or need to do. That is not like one issue. It's a whole different sort of ball of issues. And we need to uh, address all of them. Well, this was fascinating, and I'm delighted, uh, Jenny Schutz and Mike Moffat, that you could spend so much time with us on TVO tonight to help us better understand the housing crisis in, on both sides of the border and what we might do about it. So thanks, you two. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.